afternoon, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to this uh, World Health Assembly 76 side event uh, on the principles and guidelines on human rights and public health emergencies. My name is uh, Ian Seiderman. I'm the uh, legal and policy director of the International Commission of Jurists, or the ICJ, as, as we call ourselves. Um, for, for those who are not familiar, uh, we're an organization of uh, 60 leading uh, jurists, lawyers, judges, legal academics from all regions of the world. And we have our secretariat headquarters here in Geneva uh, and a number of offices uh, throughout other parts of the world as well. The ICJ, together with the Global Health Law Consortium, has been leading the process of the elaboration of these principles. And I want to thank all of you so very much for joining us today in the midst of what are very busy proceedings at the World Health Assembly. Uh, I could just uh, mention a predecessor uh, document to these principles that will be under discussion today. Uh, nearly 40 years ago, back in, in 1984, the International Commission of Jurists gathered together a group of legal experts in Sicily to draft what became known as the Syracuse Principles, or if you prefer its full name, it's the Syracuse Principles on the Limitations and Derogation Provisions in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now that previous set of principles, among other things, set out to define what states may and may not do to restrict human rights when acting to confront public emergencies and including, in particular, for our purposes, public health emergencies. And uniquely for a human rights instrument and commentary of the time, it called on states to pay uh, due regard to the international health regulation. Uh, the Syracuse principles have proven quite influential and consequential uh, since that time. Much of what is in Syracuse has been absorbed uh, into various bits of jurisprudence and commentary, including uh, by the UN Human Rights Committee. And it's uh, become quite widely accepted. Uh, it, I, we could say the core elements of the Syracuse principles may even be considered customary uh, international law at this time. Uh, and by core elements, I mean the, um, the, the components of legality, necessity, and proportionality in particular. Uh, the Syracuse principles actually discuss two types of uh, uh, situations where states can um, um, take some form of restriction or limitation from uh, human rights obligations, uh, obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, one is in situations of declared emergencies where uh, derogations are permissible, and another is just for uh, ordin ordinary times where, uh, or in all, all times actually, where uh, certain, uh, for certain rights, uh, they can be uh, restricted or limited in accordance with those principles I just mentioned. Now, as evidenced starkly by state responses to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, the Syracuse principles do remain highly pertinent. Uh, and even the WHO Director General and a number of states have relied on, on their content in, in addressing the pandemic. Yet it must be said that Syracuse has been insufficient by itself to provide much needed guidance to states and other actors on how to uphold human rights in times of public health emergencies. Uh, Syracuse developed uh, mainly around the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and so that only dealt with part of the equation, and that is ensuring that states do not unduly restrict civil and political rights. What uh, was needed, we saw, is a contemporary treatment that also took account of what needed to be done to ensure a broader rights-based approach to public health emergencies, including upholding the right to health and, and related rights. So uh, as the pandemic uh, was raging, the ICJ was very eager to enter into uh, a partnership 
uh, with the Global Health Law Consortium and their, their rich expertise in an effort to merge um, the, the, the wisdom of, of the human rights field and the public health field. And that's how uh, those are both reflected in the, in the principles that we're going to discuss. These new principles, we believe, represent a breakthrough in the ongoing effort to ensure that human rights are protected and upheld in times of crisis. And this event here uh, marks our first public dialogue on the new principles and guidelines and their subject matter, uh, focusing on the role of international human rights law in guiding approaches to public health emergency. And I think it's, uh, this is also a very there, there are quite a few of these kinds of expert principles, and this is a very good example of having, uh, having an approach that seeks to avoid fragmentation and uh, an artificial uh, sort of uh, divisions and silos in, in international law. Um, the, it takes into account human rights law, public health law, and uh, which are overlapping and complementary, and both very much needed in, in addressing a, a public health emergency such as a, as a pandemic. Uh, so regarding the format of the present, of the discussion to come, it will be in two parts. Uh, first, I'll invite uh, uh, Rujin Habibi, who led the development of these principles up to the podium to give it, provide a basic overview of the principles. Following this, uh, we will turn things over to my colleague and a collaborator on the principles, Professor Gianluca Berchi of the Graduate Institute, who will moderate the afternoon panel discussion with four distinguished panelists who are with us in person today, or maybe three, maybe three, yes, apologies. Uh, the panel session will be accompanied by an interactive question and answer with the participation of all of you joining us uh, in person and online. At the end of this session, Rujin will provide a summary of the evening's discussion and close the event for colleagues, uh, sharing some next steps as well. And just before handing over to Rujin, I would close by saying that earlier this month, the WHO Director General uh, determined that COVID-19 was no longer a public health emergency of international concern. The emergency in a strict sense may be over, but the pandemic has of course left a devastating human rights impact with millions of lives lost and uprooted and the continuing endurance of widespread physical and mental health consequences. The pandemic and the responses to it have exposed and exacerbated the profound inequalities, discriminatory practices and systemic injustices that persist globally. We hope that these new principles can serve to inform a more fully human rights grounded approach in addressing future emergencies and avoiding some of the missteps in the COVID response. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rujin. Thanks, Ian, uh, and, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the first few days of the World Health Assembly have been nothing short of inspiring, uh, and so have the excellent showcasing of events here at the Graduate Institute. And taking a beat from the tone that's already been set by the Geneva Health Week, it's an honor to be here this evening at this historical juncture uh, for the WHO, but also for the UN human rights system. The Global Health Law Consortium and the International Commission of Jurists launched this collaboration to develop the principles and guidelines on human rights and public health emergencies to rise to the challenges of a deeply perturbing moment in our shared human history. Most of us have a memory, a vivid memory, of where we were, what we felt, and what we were doing in March of 2020. From where I stand, the conversation among health law and law, law and rights practitioners and researchers was one of dismay as we saw many governments shift from complacency and neglect to rapid action, often in panic mode, to respond to a public health threat that was spreading uncontrollably. Around the world, we saw countries deploy a range of measures, from mask mandates to lockdowns to quarantines and isolation in response to this public health threat. And the measures had at least the stated objective of containing COVID-19, 
These measures also quite often limited human rights and our ability to enjoy individual freedoms, such as freedom of movement and freedom of assembly, as well as our access to economic and social rights, including health services, education, and work. The degree to which such restrictions could be justified varied widely, if at all, across local and national settings. There was no justification, however, for the egregious failures in global solidarity and international cooperation that we witnessed in this once in a century pandemic. COVID-19, as Ian has said, revealed more powerfully than any other outbreak in recent history that public health emergencies have sweeping and interconnected impacts on our lives, livelihoods, and well-beings. The international community, community must learn to move beyond cycles of panic and neglect, which leave human rights to the margins of decision-making and policy-making. We must engage as a public and within governments in a deliberate and ongoing examination of what it means to ensure rights-based approaches to public health emergencies. The principles which were developed through a consensus-based and deliberative process among 30 of the world's leading thinkers in global health law and human rights provide an authoritative interpretation of international law that can help guide that learning. And so I'd like to share three key reflections on how the principles can do just that, focusing on themes of coherence, conversation, and collaboration. So turning to coherence, existing instruments of international law, including global health law and international human rights law, provide countries with guidance on how to respect human rights in times of public health crisis. The international health regulations, for instance, the existing one, uh, cites human rights, dignity, and fundamental freedoms as a guiding principle of their implementation. The international human rights law regime, in turn, offers a rich body of human rights treaties, jurisprudence, general comments and recommendations, and other soft law instruments at international and regional levels that address health and that one can look to for direction. The principles were born out of that realization that the tapestry of international norms is already rich and complex in relation to human rights and public health emergencies, but it can also be a blunt tool it can be fragmented and it can be incoherent when it comes to applying human rights norms throughout the stages of public health emergencies, from prevention to, prepa to pre preparedness to response and then recovery. The starting point of these principles is that health and human rights are inextricably linked. This is an adage we've heard many, many times, especially during the HIV, uh, the, and during the 40 years of us uh, contending with the HIV pandemic. Um, when public health measures are designed and implemented with human dignity, rights, and the rule of law at their center, the public health emergency response as a whole stands a greater chance of success. In turn, public health measures that are grounded in the best available evidence stand greater chance of protecting our rights as well, including our rights to life and to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. But the, synod, but the principles also go beyond this crisis frame, Recognizing that how deeply a public health emergency affects a community has everything to do with how prepared and how resilient health systems are in the first place, at all levels of government. In other words, we must absolutely speak of preparedness in terms and under the framework of human rights. Without efforts to prepare for these, without efforts to prepare it, drastic measures to respond to public health threat, measures that are far more likely to restrict, to lead to restrictions to human rights, may ultimately become necessary. The aim of the principles is to build on existing interpretations of international law, including most significantly the Syracuse principles, which Ian mentioned, developed by the International Commission of Jurists more than 35 years ago. But these principles also deepen that normative imperative in the Syracuse principles, recognizing that there are ambiguities and tensions inherent to public health emergencies, but also opportunities for normative advancement um, when one turns one's mind to looking to, to thinking through what rights-based emergency approaches to public health emergencies means. And these key areas of, of ambiguity and tension, but also opportunity, include the fact that the need for further delinea delineation of the obligations of private actors, including uh, not in, in particular private healthcare providers and insurers, manufacturers of health goods, facilities, and services, also ob obligations to realize economic and social cultural rights, even and especially in times of crisis, and the crucial role of deliberation, participation, and trust in the design and uptake of public health policies and measures. <laughs> 
I want to emphasize that the goal of seeking coherence in international law in relation to public health emergency prevention, preparedness, and response does not amount to an exercise of finding the lowest common denominator or settling for that. As we often see, this is the case in international lawmaking. But more often than not, there are progressive interpretations of international law if one looks for them. One could, for instance, look to the inter-American human rights system to find more progressive interpretations of the human rights duties of private actors. One could look to the European and African human rights systems, which have developed stronger normative foundations for solidarity within societies and across communities and at the international level. The principles consolidate international law, but they seek to consolidate progressively, moving away from the tendency and the urge to find lowest common de denominators. And this brings me to the second contribution that I hope these principles will make, to serve as a springboard for conversation. That might sound like low-hanging fruit, but a key metric of success for these principles is that they foster conversation and reflection among a wide range of interested parties, from international lawyers, diplomats, and policymakers, to human rights defenders, to health and other frontline workers, and so many others, and to bring all these actors together in our shared thinking about pathways to promote rights-based measures to prevent, prepare for, and respond to public health emergencies. Conversation and dialogue were, in fact, embedded in the development of these principles. In developing them over the last three years, we engaged in dozens of virtual and in-person gatherings, three main conferences, and regional dialogues with human rights defenders at the front lines of COVID-19 responses in their communities. We revised the principles iteratively, iteratively in light of the collective wisdom that we gained. The life and development of these principles during the course of a pandemic was only possible thanks to that ongoing commitment from a wide range of people to deliberate, debate, and engage in shared learning. In that regard, the principles should be absolutely considered a living document, subject to revision in step with our ever-evolving knowledge of how best to plan, prepare for, and respond to these emergencies. And this brings me to my final point, which is collaboration. As much as conversation and dialogue are necessary, we hope these principles ultimately inspire others to lead deliberative efforts at, uh, at, at le all levels of governance to think through effective normative frameworks at the intersection of human rights and public health emergency. This is a crucial time to share these principles with the world as the international community commemorates the 75th anniversary of d the WHO's constitution, but also the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our appreciation for these instruments and the foundation they laid for the international right to health and health-related rights is perhaps no greater than it is today. And building on that 75-year history, we hope these principles will serve as a foundation for the emergence and evolution of further norms and guidelines that will help ensure that future public health emergencies are centered on rights because that will make the emergency response and prevention efforts stronger. But more than that, we hope they equip civil society, jurists, and others with the tools to hold their governments accountable for action as well. We invite all of you today, in person and online, and those who will watch later on, to consider this a standing invitation to take part in the promotion and diffusion of these principles. Reach out to us with ideas on how they can be useful to you, how we can collaborate further and develop more outputs drawing from the basis of this work, how we can engage with you on advocacy, research, and policy making. We are ready and we're, we're very eager to engage in that work. And in closing, I want to extend our sincere gratitude to all those who've supported this effort over the three years that, they've, that this project has been ongoing, especially to the project's outstanding steering committee, made up of Tim Fish Hodgson, Rocio Quintero, Ian Cederman, who was with us uh, just a few minutes ago, Sam Zarifi, who's seated here with us uh, as a panelist, and uh, members of the Global Health Law Consortium, including Pedro Villarreal, Judith Bueno de Mesquita, Luciano Bottini Filo, Sharifa Sekalala. A huge thank you goes out to them. And it also goes out to the Global Health Law Consortium's chair in particular, Professor Benjamin Meyer, for standing steadfast by this work from day one and urging it throughout the rocky steps that it had along the way. We're also truly tremendous, tr truly and tremendously grateful 
and fortunate to have contributions, engagement, and ultimately the endorsement and co-authorship of some of the world's brightest and best in global health law and human rights, whose names are too many to mention right now, but who, who we have Magdalena and John Luca among them seated with us here today. And ultimately, thanks goes as well to the consultants we hired to lead the regional dialogues on these principles, including Gabrielle Armas Cardona, Farnoosh Hameshian, uh, Amaka Ojiako, India, India House, Srinath Nambudiri, Yogi Bratajaya, and Rocio Quintero, whose con contributions were essential to the building up of this framework. A thanks is finally owed to, our, to the organizations that helped fund this work, including the Open Society Foundations, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the University of Warwick School of Law, the Brochet Foundation, and of course, thank you so much to the Global Health Center for giving us this platform to discuss the principles here today with you. Thank you as well goes to our co-sponsors for the event, Physicians for Human Rights, Global Initiative for Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, um, and, uh, and of course the International Commission of Jurists and the Global Health Law Consortium. It takes a village. So with that, I um, am very pleased to uh, hand it over to John Luca and to, to engage in a conversation, a critical conversation on these principles. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regine. It looked like an Oscar acceptance speech. Now, when you <laughs> thank absolutely everybody, but I think that uh, this thanks absolutely you. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. It's good to see quite a, a number of people in the room. And as usual, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to the people online. Uh, that we are surprised sometimes that we we have events at this time. We have people from Japan, from Australia. They really either don't go to bed or they wake up very early in the morning to listen to this. So it's quite. Um, it's quite encouraging, I must say. So, um, as Rujin said, this principle took quite a long time. I think Rujin summarized very well a very thorough, unusually thorough and participative process. So it's good that it's a living document, but let's let it rest for a bit. And uh, I think it's important also that it takes its own wings and in a way the proof is in the pudding. Uh, how how much traction it will get uh, in, in shaping uh, human rights practice and so on. So. Without further ado, let's start with our panel. The aim of the panel is to get some insights, both on the issues raising the principles, and we all participate in one way or the other in their elaboration, but also uh, more generally on, on the question that Ian and, and Rujin raised. So how to, in a way, prioritize or uh, strengthen human rights, both in response to health emergencies, but also when we talk about preparedness, prevention, recovery. So not just the short term of what we do when we are in the middle of COVID, but also how we embed human rights in all the phases that precede a health emergency and follow a health emergency. And um, think just of the risk of mainstreaming very intrusive surveillance measures uh, for the purpose of protecting us from the future pandemic. It happened after 9-11 in the name of security. The risk is also that it happens now in the name of health security. So there are many things to, to discuss. So we have three panelists here. There was a fourth, uh, Steve Solomon, uh, principal legal officer in WHO that is stuck in the, in the health assembly. He sends his regrets. Uh, Rugin has asked me to play Steve for a few minutes, so when he comes to that at the end, I'll say a few things on his behalf. But let's start with our wonderful panel. So to my immediate right, I have Viviana, Viviana Munoz, who is the program coordinator on health, intellectual property, and biodiversity program of the South Center. At the other extreme is Magdalena Sepulveda, who is executive director of the Global Initiative for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and former special rapporteur of the Human Rights Council on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. So a very important experience. And last but not least, my colleague and friend, Sam Zarifi, who is now executive director of Physicians for Human Rights, but formerly was president, was your... Oh, Secretary General of the International Commission of Jurists, and one definitely of the, of the leaders in developing the, the principles. You can find all the bios on the event page. I will ask a few leading questions to the panelists, asking them to stay within seven, eight minutes if possible, uh, and then uh, maybe a couple of follow-up questions, and then open the floor uh, for questions from the audience. And people participating online uh, can uh, definitely contribute with a question using the, uh, the question and answer uh, button on, on WebEx.
Let's start with Sam. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you serve ahead of the International Commission of Juries during the acute phases of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, can you share with us why you found it and basically important, essential to engage with the Global Health Law Consortium and to develop this, in a way, the frame uh, to better protect human rights, and in particular, why to do so through a set of principles. It could have been done in many other different ways, but you choose to do it, you, you sort of propose it in, a, in the frame of a number of principles. Can, can you take us a bit through it? Thank you, uh, Gianluca. Um, thanks for everyone for inviting me back. Uh, now that I'm not with the ICJ anymore and with Physicians for Human Rights. But um, really, I would say the genesis of this actually, Gianluca, really from, from my side was a disagreement that you and I had. Uh, it was March 2nd, uh, 2020. I had just returned from Asia, and we were discussing uh, at that point China's uh, response to, to COVID which seemed astonishing and unprecedented. And the fact that entire cities had been completely locked down. People were starving on the street, they couldn't get to work. And you and I had a discussion and, and at a public uh, event, and, and I said something like, well, I think China's response does not comply with human rights. It, it clearly violates the Syracuse principles. And you said, well, why should the Syracuse principles apply to a public health response? Now, I thought the Syracuse principles were, were uh, you know, common law at this point, and if not that, even more uh, clearly accepted. But uh, the, the response in China and what we were then seeing in March 2020 was, I think, beautifully uh, formulated by, uh, probably by Rujan, I'm guessing, as panic and, and negligence. Uh, and neglect. And neglect. And, and governments that seemed like they had never thought about the possibility of a pandemic responded uh, by effectively completely trampling human rights. And in discussions that we had with governments, but also with human rights defenders, our colleagues around the world, it was clear that we were seeing a level of, well, two things. One is governments were not properly responding to this pandemic. So the pandemic itself was obviously uh, uh, resulting in huge numbers of, of deaths and, and people who were suffering long-term injuries. And we had multiple governments either asking uh, people to um, uh, stay home and never leave or to pray and hope it all gets better, or to take bleach, or, or uh, any, any, number of, any number of totally inappropriate responses, uh, which, of course, was violating the right to health and life of, of people around the world. So that was one level. And the second level was the, the restrictions we had seen were really unprecedented. Uh, it was beyond any kind of martial law that we had seen in many, many circumstances around the world. And so the idea was we have to respond to this. It wasn't just through a set of principles. We tried to engage in litigation. We wrote multiple reports. Uh, we tried to support our colleagues and human rights defenders around the world. But um, going back to the Syracuse principles, um, 40 years ago, the Syracuse principles were developed as a response to the um, high number of states of emergency, especially, I think, around Latin America, where governments were de declaring a state of emergency and violating rights on the basis of some nebulous threat. Um, we saw a second wave of this after the global war on terror, and you had mentioned this, where, again, some kind of a threat was used to violate human rights and used to put in place restrictions that we had never seen before. And we started to respond to that. What we saw is that although under international law, threats to public health can be a basis for restricting some rights. Some rights can be restricted as part of a response to public health emergency, but this concept had not been really addressed, certainly not in the Syracuse principles, which simply said, let's pay attention to the international health regulations of the World Health Organization. And in development since then, there hadn't really been much thought given to that. So after that discussion, I went on Google and I started looking at pandemic, public health, and Syracuse principles. And I think one of the articles that came up with was Rujan's article. So of course, 
uh, and this is a shout out to all the unheralded, underpaid, hardworking graduate students around the world who do all the hard work so I don't have to. I contacted her and said, can you please tell me about the Syracuse principles and public health? And so here we are three years later. The idea is that these principles can be, uh, now that the pandemic has been declared over, can be used as the basis of preparation and of responses and of recovery. And I think it's particularly important that we're launching it this week because we're seeing the World Health Assembly, the progress around the international health regulations, the pandemic treaty, and what I don't see much, if at all really in those discussions, is a reference to human rights. As if this is the first time that a major emergency has arisen and that governments want to restrict it and they have no idea about human rights. Now, part of it is that these are different communities. Human rights people like me, now I work for Physicians for Human Rights, but I'm not a physician. Uh, I don't know much about public health, but the public health lawyers and certainly the ministries of health know very little about human rights. And so, nevertheless, those two communities have a lot to say to each other. So that's where we are, and that's why I hope these principles can act as kind of a North Star for everyone. They, they, they establish some clear directions of movement. They don't tell governments what to do, but they give them a direction of movement and a way of thinking. And I hope that we use this time properly to prepare for what it will be an inevitable future pandemic um, uh, arising. And, and we hope that these principles will be uh, looked at, will be discussed, and will be used to uh, implement global, national, and regional responses. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> Excellent introduction. So, good point. I also, I teach a course on global health law. We have a class on human rights, and Syracuse are part of the, of the, of the, of the primary sources, and there are only two very sort of concise references to health. So, definitely, they were not developed with health in mind. So health has sort of uh, taken center stage in many respects. For example, access to pathogens is shaped by a biodiversity law that was never conceived for this. So we have a lot of, 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 new, of new things. And I want to come back to the question of the presence or absence of human rights in the current negotiations in WHO uh, at the end, because I think that's something they, worth discussing for a moment. Uh, Magdalena, if I may pass on to you. So as a former special rapporteur, of the Human Rights Council on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. You, you devoted a great deal of your time to investigating inequalities within and between countries. And so how has your observations in your current capacity as, as a former Special Rapporteur shaped your perspective on how countries have handled pandemics and other disease outbreaks? Because you remember beginning of COVID, it says COVID is a big equalizer. COVID has been the big disequalizer, I mean. So in a way, it goes straight into, into your experience. And what is the relationship between inequality, poverty, and the impact of public health emergencies? And since you participated in, in the elaboration of the principle, how do you see the principles in trying to, as, as Sam said, give direction to government and other stakeholders on addressing these issues? Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca, for the for the question, and and also because of uh, the quote that you just made, that that idea that COVID will uh, will be an equalizer, that we were all impacted. Of course, we were all impacted, but in so many different ways. Um, it's remind me of a beautiful song of uh, Leonard Cohen that says, "Everybody knows the the rich get rich and the poor get poor." So, uh, and this is what it happens. So the, the first things, and let me bring the inequality angle. Of course, those who suffered the most and shouldered the impact of COVID and also the recovery now, were those group in every country that have suffered discrimination along the line of gender, immigration status, um, disability, um, you name it. Uh, so they were the ones, sexual orientation, they were really the ones that suffered the most. Uh, and after COVID, they, they are poorer than before we start the crisis because they have less, as, less access to healthcare, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't move 
um, to, to different places. So most of the people living in poverty around the world have informal jobs. And there were no market, there were no job, there were no income. Particularly worrisome, and I think that this is something that we always need to stress, was gender inequality. So in countries and in regions like Latin America, my own, in which the gender gap were big, what happened with COVID was that women um, has be, have, have a retrogression in their rights in a way that we, have, we are behind in decades. Why? Because they were not only impacted by COVID as everybody else, but of course they were those uh, disproportionately represented in public sector, uh, in the sectors that were more uh, impacted by COVID, transportation, uh, services, tourism. Um, they suffer um, significant violence against women. When tensions arise, there's a lot of violence. And we are, we are seeing now how many young girls are not going back to school. So we are going to see generation of young girls that will not finish school. But most important of all was the fact that the already unfair distribution of care and domestic work suffered and spike. So before pandemic, women and girls were doing the lion share of uh, domestic care and um, domestic work and care work. Uh, and with COVID, what happened was that this increased enormously, impacting the way in which women can enjoy rights on an equal basis of boys or men. So there is no same, same success at school. There is no sa same uh, job promotion. Uh, but there is also an impact on health. There is a limit of how much work women can do uh, without impacting their health. So inequality, those who suffered the most uh, were uh, further marginalized and left behind. But the other part was the richer get rich and how this happened. We have seen the numbers. So the super rich around the world in every region of the world became richer everywhere. And why is this possible? There are many reasons, but one important reason, and this is something that started happening before the pandemic, is the privatization, commercialization, and financialization of public services such as healthcare, water and sanitation, and education. So there are many ways in which private actors can be involved in healthcare. Uh, it can be running a public health facility or delivering medicines. There are many other ways, of, excuse me, also through uh, participating in health infrastructure through um, a public partner, a private public partnership. So the rich were having all these opportunities. So uh, health centers, privatized health centers that were um, giving access to those who had access and have money, were uh, increasing their, their money. And they continue to do so. So at some moment in the middle of the COVID pandemic, there was this crossroad in which as everybody was impacted by the lack of public services, and in particular middle classes, there are one who, those who vote, everybody understood how important it was to have um, public school, public education, in which everybody could benefit. And I thought, and as many other, that this could change the paradigm. And after that, state will start investing more on public services and healthcare. But no, it has not happened that. Also worry about the economic crisis uh, and costs also by the pandemic, states start again, deregularizing and opening their market for private sector. So again, what we're seeing is that the rich get richer and uh, we continue to marginalize people. The more the private sector take over services that respond to economic, social and cultural rights, healthcare, education, 
water and sanitation, social protection, care, those, that, that fact uh, made many others to uh, may leave behind. So how these principles are addressing these two issues that I mentioned. One, the issue of access, and that is prevention. So in any crisis, we're going to exacerbate inequality. So we need to act now. We need to ensure that everybody has access to universal, resilient health system that is affordable or to no cost at all for those who need it. And that is included in the principles. I think that that is principle five. It is included there. That is something that a state should do. And what happened with the role of private actors? The principles uh, are also addressing the issue of the private actor's involvement in health. And how do they do that? They call for better regulation and monitoring of the involvement of private actors in health, and that is very, very important. Um, and also even name what type of private actors we should look at, from those who provide uh, medical services or medical care to insurers, or those who um, build or provide a good services and infrastructure related to public services. So the principles look at today, how a state should stop this increased tendency of privatizing. Well, that is, I am saying that, that's my own interpretation of the principle, but you can see principles five and call for ensuring access to universal health care, and it's very, health system and it's very difficult to get access to universal health care system um, if it's not a public system but it's also refers to uh, the regulation and monitoring of private actors thank you thank you very much excellent point in particular who are the who have been the winners of the pandemic have been mark zuckerberg jeff bezos have been this unaccountable corporate titans that are dominating the world, which is to, to me something incredibly skewed. At times of war, there are winners and losers also among governments. I'm not sure how many governments have come out of this as winners. They, they run an incredible amount of debt just to create some, 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 some safety nets and so on. So as you said correctly, the more we privatize, the more we create the basis for these incredible inequalities. So I hope that's something that we can discuss also with, with the audience. Okay, Viviana, over, over to you. <laughs> so, you're a senior person in the South Center, which is not, not, maybe not everybody knows it, and maybe you want to introduce a little bit your organization, which is very active also on access to medicines and so on. It's one of the things that are the most important voices in Geneva. But, so, one of the biggest failures during the pandemic was a failure of solidarity. Dr. Tedros called it like a, a moral failure, he used a very strong term. Basically, countries were unwilling or unable to scale up equitable access to medical countermeasures uh, to stem the emergency. I remember in early 2020, we said Canada had uh, bilateral deals to, to um, <clears throat> vaccinate the population five times over. And many countries simply could not even get access to uh, <clears throat> To, uh, to, to the, the, the big pharmaceutical companies. So the South Center, as I said, has played a crucial role in calling on countries to change the status quo. So the profits cannot prevail over health and, and human rights. So can you take us a bit through the magnitude of this problem as you have experienced it from, from your perspective and, and, and what is the work of the, of the South Center in this respect? Thank you, Gianluca, and thank you to the organizers for this very good event, for having invited South Center. So first of all, let me just tell you a few words of South Center for those that you might not know our institution. Uh, we're a think tank of developing countries established as an international intergovernment organization, so membership of developing countries around the world. Um, but we're a very small institution based in Geneva, and the reason for that is um, because our work is directly linked to important international processes of negotiations. Um, and I think linking already a point that's been made in these discussions is um, how do we ensure this coherence between many different policy areas where we have different communities, but we have 
a need to really integrate uh, different aspects. Um, and of course, human rights is one pathway um, that really can help us to do that. So our institution deals with issues from the international financial architecture to global health, um, to taxation issues, climate change, biodiversity, public health, and human rights. And in first image, you would think, well, these are all separate areas, but actually there's a lot of integration um, that should happen. And um, it, partly what we see with, with the health and human rights um, linkage, um, that has become prominent. But with other areas, for example, in trade, we see direct tensions coming into play. Um, and so that is one of the areas where, where we do a lot of work. Um, so we have a number of research outputs, uh, studies on many of these areas that you can find on our websites, um, as well as providing capacity building and negotiating support to our member states, particularly in Geneva and in, in UN processes. And of course, we also always welcome um, very highly able students, in particular from developing countries, to also join us and, and help us do that work. Um, with that, uh, I want to come then to, to, again, the topic of vaccine inequity, which was uh, a highlight, I think, of, of what we saw of major problems during the COVID-19 response. And um, some would say, well, this is a very, we all have the clear picture, but actually it seems uh, that it's, it's quickly being forgotten, or we don't seem to have drawn the lessons now as we're discussing as a global community of how do we move forward to avoid this happening once again when we have the future pandemic. It's not if, if it's when will it happen. Um, so let's recall that the statistics tell us that um, we had about excess mortality, that means directly and indirectly from COVID, over or about 16 million. Um, so that's over the 6 million counted deaths for that WHO tells us. Their studies then said about 17 mil million or so. In addition to that, recent study, for example, of Nature Medicine says that if we had had greater vaccine equity, at least by 2021, 2022 period when the vaccines were available, we could have adverted at the minimum about a million and a half deaths. So we're talking about a lot of people's lives that could have been saved if we had done things differently. Now, could we have done things differently? That is the important question. And that's where we should be reflecting now as part of the international debate of where do we go with member state processes of a pandemic treaty? What should the UNGA do and so forth? And it seems we're being dwelled into nitty gritty details, for example, um, a lot of emphasis and, and other important areas such as surveillance and forth. But the issue of, of vaccine equity needs to be right at the top in particular, um, because this is one of the measures where we know that for this kind of, of pandemic really could have helped reduce um, uh, deaths as well as generally the, the spread of the infection. So um, what, what could have we have done better? Um, clearly, we saw that um, the, the principles that WHO had established for vaccine allocation were not followed. Um, so uh, there was the, the uh, attempt to have a distribution of allocation of reaching at least 20%, that critical population that needed to be vaccinated first around the world in an equal manner. So the idea was, you know, if we have, when we have vaccine doses, we will distribute proportionally at least 20% and really highlight of the more vulnerable populations that need to go first. Um, and that did not happen particularly because the richer countries um, did advanced marketing commitments, so basically bought early enough with the manufacturers that we have, we have a, a market concentration for vaccines overall. And in the case of COVID-19, even though we did not know which ones would be effective, well, it was only a handful of companies that in any case came out with effective vaccines. Um, so in this rush, we had extreme limited uh, global supply. And at that moment is when we really had to say, you know, vaccines should be a global public good. How do we get that to happen? Well, there was not the direct reaction. WHO, to give credit, did say, you know, vaccines should be a global public good. Here's the reallocation framework. How do we do this? There was no system prior to determine how to globally allocate. There was an attempt by a few, you know, small parties, and this was not even centralized with WHO, to say, let's set up a system. This is going to um, create equitable distribution. But clearly, this system, as you know, COVAX, it really failed in its mission to create the global allocation 
of vaccines in a fair way. I mean, the rich countries did not play into the system. They said, no, we'll purchase separately and we'll make sure we go first. And then the system for allocation was left for um, developing countries and least developed countries to basically you know, try to gather whatever resources funding could do to compete with those um, already advanced purchase commitments of rich countries. And so we had competition rather than cooperation. That was one of the big problems, I think, clearly for vaccine equity. Then again, when we talked about solidarity, it was not just about giving some vaccine doses. So we had a system of charity more than real solidarity. What could have we had is to say, well, now that we have vaccines, we know how to manufacture them. Let's quickly get the clinical information out, share this, let's get the technology out there. If there are barriers such as patent rights, let's address them. Um, there's ways we can do this, being fair to the innovators. But no, we did not have any of those elements in play. Um, and therefore, this just meant that we were on market terms for vaccine access, everyone competing, governments with limited resources um, putting in for buying vaccines. So in terms of that situation, just linking back to our discussion on, on human rights, um, is to say that we really need, I think, the two elements of how do we ensure that we have new rules um, clear for member state actions, in particular with regards to avoiding that other states may not be able to comply with their obligations, including on protecting the right to health and access to medicines, vaccines, diagnostics, by those actions of other states, and also for non-state actors, I mean, uh, business non-state actors. Here they really had a very um, soft ride, let's say. Um, they had the upper hand in the advanced marketing commitments. We lost an opportunity from public sector and a lot of public sector money went into financing research and development um, for the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's about 97 or more percent of those resources that led to that innovation. Um, and how did we bring back that value, public value, um, of the vaccines, and that could have been a mechanism. We need, for example, to have concrete elements within those contracts with uh, manufacturers um, to ensure that there is a more fair deal which will lead to expanding access. So there's a way to do that, and that's what we like to see now in the pandemic instrument and in these discussions, is those concrete ways that the public um, health, uh, right to health, and these additional human rights principles helps us to do, and then bring that into concrete language obligations that we can deliver um, clearly so, so states will have to be obliged to follow these things. Thank you, Viviana. Excellent. <clears throat> and so the vaccine is a global public good. So there's been a lot of talk about that. How do we get there? Because obviously global public good is a economic theory about no river rules, no competitive goods, has been exported into almost like political science. But we talk about something like vaccine, which is immensely uh, river rules. Either you have it or I have it. So one of the big challenges is how do we inject that uh, the concept? And I think the, 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 the pandemic treaty draft tries to go a bit in that direction. I don't know how successfully. And, and the second, if I may, uh, COVAX, everybody has criticized COVAX, and with the benefit of hindsight, probably there were many mistakes. But don't let's forget, COVAX was launched at the beginning of April. Uh, so one month into generalized lockdown uh, all over the world. So uh, we have also to recognize the, if you want the ambition and the effort to, to create something out of nothing, out of nowhere, uh, probably on, on, uh, on the wrong basis, counting on developed countries to play the game, and they did not, and so on. But there have been calls to somehow don't scrap it, uh, learn from your mistakes, and keep a sort of virtual platform that can kick in at another emergency. Let's see uh, how far that goes. So as I said, uh, <clears throat> Uh, our colleague Steve Solomon uh, cannot be with us this afternoon. And um, the, 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 the question I would like to ask to him, because he's very involved in following from the point of view of the legal office of WHO, both negotiation, international health regulations and the pandemic treaty. And what was his view as to the prospect that this instrument can uh, give justice to the protection of human rights? Um, <clears throat> before coming here, I took a look at the uh, at the text that are now being negotiated. There is a new text that came out yesterday of the pandemic treaty prepared by the Bureau, by the officers of the negotiating body, and there is even less 
humanized language that there was in the previous version. There is one principle, uh, principle in Article 3, there is a set of principles fairly developed uh, on, on human rights. There is a strange reference to civil and human rights, which shows a bit of a sort of a literacy problem there when it comes to health workforce. And there is something on another article, Article 13, on humanitarian access. So, in a way, access at times or armed conflict or, or other emergency. But that's all. And the amendments to the IHR are also kind of underwhelming when it comes to human rights. There is something in Article 2, which is about the scope of the instrument, and there is even a proposal to delete the reference to human rights in Article 3 on the principles underpinning the, the IHR. So, in a way, that opens a bit of a paradox. Uh, human rights have been one of the casualties of COVID, as I think my colleagues have very sort of a cogently uh, argued. And so why is human rights absent, in a way, from the negotiation? And so, in a way, rather than responding myself, I abuse my role of moderator to bounce it off to you. Uh, because there are two schools of thoughts, in a way. There are people, and I'm sure some of our colleagues listening online, like Professor Maya that Rujin mentioned before, that are, are very uh, clear that it is a failure, that these, uh, these instruments should be very um, aggressive, maybe not the right way, but should be much more elaborated, much more a substance on human rights, because otherwise we are missing an opportunity. We, as you said, the public health community doesn't have very high human rights literacy. Uh, I think the HIV AIDS pandemic start putting these two communities together, otherwise they're proceeding on parallel tracks and they were not talking to each other. But this lack of familiarity has remained and we see it, I think, in the negotiations. So some people say uh, it's a failure and we have to do something about it. Other people say, why is it a failure? This is a public health instrument. It's not a, hu a new human rights instrument. There is a whole panoply of human rights treaties, um, mechanisms, uh, monitoring bodies at the global level, at the regional level, Level, let them do their job. They should do the human rights part. The question is a linkage, if you want, a better linkage between health and human rights, between WHO and the human rights bodies. So, and if you try to inject human rights, you complicate negotiations even more. They're complicated enough without putting more human rights language. So, oversimplifying, I see these two schools of thought. One is a failure, the other, no, it is not. It is the way it should be. The issue is how to make these two worlds work better when it comes to implementing these two, um, these two messages, if you want. What do you think about that? What is your position? And I guess Sam would be the, the, the logical candidate for, for this question. And I hope I'm not sort of misconstruing, but that's the way I... No, I think those are the two approaches. Um, certainly, what came out of COVID, what COVID really laid bare for, for many people, certainly for me and I think many in the human rights community, is what had been a criticism of the global health framework uh, that is now quite... quite um, explicit that it is uh, an outgrowth of a colonial imperialist mindset. It's, it's a framework that was established uh, at a time when really the idea was just to make sure that, uh, uh, that the West and the North stayed healthy and that the bad illnesses of the South stayed in the South and didn't get too far out of control. And uh, it, it, the fact that it is driven by um, by capitalists and, and um, well, patriarchal impulses is that the existing international health relations really, other than in principle three where they mention human rights, really are concerned about trade and travel. That's where human rights come in. So that international health regulations and global pandemics just should be controlled so they don't interfere with travel and trade. I mean, that's just the text. So uh, I think the calls for decolonizing this, this structure are now quite, quite loud and quite insistent and something we should heed. I mean, that's, that's, that's my personal view. Now, uh, you mentioned that the discussions around the pandemic health treaty, as you said, it's gone backwards. Uh, 
The international health regulations really only refer to human rights in two places. One is the human rights of travelers, and the second is principle three. There were 307 amendments put forth for the text. The Africa group is the only one that suggested adding human rights in principle two. India suggested taking out the reference to human rights. Very disappointing that the Global South is a uh, leader, kind of uh, moral leader would, would take that position. And nobody else really talked about it. South Korea. South Korea also mentioned human rights in the context of privacy. And randomly, the Syracuse principle. So a shout out to the lonely legal advisor in the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Korea that just managed to get that in there. But so uh, from a human rights point of view, that's the problem. Now, the other side, whether we should try to integrate these systems, uh, whether we should just allow this to move forward. Um, aside from the rhetoric and the ideology, I mean, clearly the global response to COVID, as, as, as we just heard, was a disaster. Was a disaster. I mean, 17 million dead. You know, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, some guy put incendiary devices in his shoes, and we still have to take our shoes off when we go through the airport. And we've already forgotten the lessons of, of the pandemic that was just three months ago. And the notion that people are not talking about how to make vaccination, how to make treatment, how to make preparation and recovery more sensible is, is just a sign. I mean, it's an absolute abdication of global responsibility. Uh, this is not for us to go to our colleagues and to try to colonize, to take over another field by human rights experts. I would suggest that for the IHR and for the pandemic treaty, it would simply really suffice for them to say explicitly that nothing in these treaties will weaken existing human rights obligations. And maybe even more, that everything in these treaties will be performed, will be implemented in compliance with existing human rights obligations, which by the way, that's what these principles are. These are not brave new calls for radical change. These are really, uh, can be criticized as, as statements of existing, of existing standards, things that governments have already signed on to. And I think that's where we are. And again, we know there's going to be another pandemic coming. We know that we will need vaccines again. We know that we will need to deal with the restrictions again. This is the chance to look at these principles and say, these will give us some sense of how we should respond the next time the house is on fire. Uh, Absolutely, yes. I think, I, so. yeah. I think that the, the, this, it's, it's very short-sighted not to include human rights in, in any treaty. And this is not about only, or let human rights people get involved with a, a public health expert and come out to something together. The short-sightedness is in the fact that um, human rights provide a lens in which we can put people at the center of the discussion. What we have seen and the crisis in all the crises in which we are in, from the climate crisis to the economic crisis that we're facing, are because we have put profit over people. And it is a failure of the economic and the social model in which we are in. So if we don't address issues in a comprehensive manner, uh, if we don't address the uh, vaccine equity, if we don't address taxation, how to finance certain things, we don't address human rights, we're not going to solve the problem. So it is, I understand the simplicity of saying, well, these two alternatives. But the failure, it's, it's an overall failure of really having the chance to taking measures now that could prevent and make us to be prepared for the next crisis. So, and this is also bring me to, we are facing multiple crises. So from the climate crisis, the inequality crisis, the cost of living crisis, and it's not the perfect storm. It's not that the world is in, has this very bad luck and is happening, this bad luck is happening to the humanity. It's not like that. I mean, we have created the crisis in which we are in. And if we don't take action now, we're not going to solve any of them. And 
the climate emergency that also requires to redistribute resources, to look at the economy in a different way, to look at solidarity and collaboration between countries in a different way, if we don't address that, it's going to be the end of humanity. So we have to address it now. So the end of humanity is maybe not how I want to, co to conclude this, uh, this panel discussion. But <laughs> <laughs> I liked your uh, idea of this uh, without prejudice clause, that uh, the treaty will, will not prejudice existing, because that's an argument I heard, that if things go wrong, and if the pandemic treaty has fairly restrictive clauses on access to medicine, that could be interpreted by some countries to say, well, this is my obligation. I don't particularly care on the right to health, because it's more specific rules. So there is a risk of, back, of slipping back, actually, I think. Yeah. Okay, before I open to the, quest to, to, to the audience, I have a last question. Uh, and also, Viviana, I, I, I welcome your comments. And it has to do with the future of the principles. Because, uh, and that's something Rugin is, is writing her PhD on this. So I also, if you want to comment on this. Basically, so Syracuse principle, we all know them, we mentioned them, they have a lot of traction. We had other principles that were developed on human rights and so on with a similar process, the similar kind of groups behind it, and they more or less have fallen into obscurity. So. I mean, maybe it's too strong, but anyway, I have not had the level of success of Syracuse. So how do we make sure that these principles get traction? Uh, how do we ensure, if possible, that they are a, a new Syracuse, that they get the same level of relevance, the same level of, 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 of uh, a positive push on practice, on thinking, on reflection, and, and so on? What are the ingredients for this? Viviana, want to start? Sure. No, I think, of course not, being the non-expert on human rights here, I, I, I took the floor first, but um, just to say that generally the activism um, that can be done around this is, is so important because what, what it's really about is, is generating more accountability um, for states as well as, as, as what we said in particular now for non-state actors that seem to have very little regulation. In the case of vaccine equity, for example, what's being presented or offered is to say, um, we'll voluntarily um, create uh, a percentage of vaccines that will keep for developing countries and LDCs, but please don't put anything binding in the international instrument or in the international health regulations um, that would create any um, serious legal obligation. Um, but you know, trust our our, our own self-regulation, which I think comes back to Magdalena's point that this is happening across the board in many issues. And then states are often responding, well, you know, it's not us; it's just these very powerful actors. Um, come on, so this is, I think, that, that activism that this community can create and link up to the activism of the you know, um, uh, public health community and others from the climate change movements and, and, and just link these advocacy movements for these general issues can be really powerful. Um, and the other point I would just say in terms of litigation, I mean, it's a very powerful tool as well. It takes some time, but once you have um, strategic litigation that works, and of course you're building important jurisprudence and of course then of co hopefully we'll have some customary law coming out of that even if we don't have an international instrument. Um, one of the am amazing things about international law is that there is an aspect of, um, of opinio juris and customary international law and so if enough people say that certain principles are so, then they become so. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that many of the principles, well, maybe there are huge sets of principles, but some principles have escaped obscurity, Syracuse being at the top, but another set of principles, for instance, that the ICJ was involved with um, were the Yogyakarta principles, were a set of principles around the rights of LGBT people. And at the time that the principles were drafted in a similar kind of process uh, with, with a group of experts from around the world, you know, they were really viewed as aspirational, although they were really just stating the principle of non-discrimination effectively, that it was just a, uh, a, 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 an extrapolation on that. Now, in the 25 years or so since, since the Yogyakarta principles, through this process of advocacy, 
Uh, we started seeing it being cited in various discussions and then being used in litigation. And th that's an amazing thing because what happened is human rights lawyers and activists started citing the Yogyakarta principles in defense of what they were arguing. And then some judge somewhere said, well, the Yogyakarta principles reflect international consensus. And so therefore in our country, that, that is the case. And we've now seen that in multiple countries around the world, especially in, in the effort to try to end discrimination against LGBT people, um, mostly in common, common, uh, Commonwealth countries that have the old British uh, Article 377. So there, there is a life and a process to these, to these principles through a process of advocacy, activism, um, international discussion, and, and, and litigation. And one hopes also at some point that legislators and government officials and even non-state actors will simply realize the enormity of what we are facing. This notion that COVID was supposed to be the great equalizer and that it absolutely wasn't. The fact that it set global poverty back, that it set global poverty, global wealth accumulation so far forward is something that we have a responsibility and an opportunity to fight right now. And again, the idea for these principles is that we hope sensible people will use them to give some direction to where they should go, but that activists and advocates will start to use them and to challenge. Uh, we saw challenges to COVID responses around the world, both in terms of restrictions, but in terms of government failure to act. Some of those were quite effective. And I think it's important that we continue to, to use those processes to, to, uh, to make sure that the next time, again, that we avoid the same weak response. Amendment, I'm going to now uh, finish in a positive note. So there, there have been a lot of uh, so-called soft law instruments like these principles that have been later on uh, trans transform into convention. For example, the IDP principles were trust IDP, the internal displaced uh, people's principles were later translated in the Kampala Convention on Internally Displaced People. The Limburg principle and the Maastricht guidelines on economic, social, and cultural right were the basis for the drafting of the optional protocol to the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. In other cases, um, as it has been said, there, these principles ended up in national law. So the IDP principles, for example, are law in Colombia that regulate a lot of aspects of internally displaced persons and our national law. Uh, the same happened with many other principles, like the business and human rights principles. Has, they have been translated into law at the domestic country. So the truth is that in between a soft law and a law, a binding law, there is a great area that is very, is very broad. So many principles are very close to law. Uh, and in particular, when they really translate, like this principle, existing standards, because their legal weight come from the standard that they're interpreting. So they come from the legal source directly. Excellent. And that's what was one of the discussions throughout the elaboration of the principle. Should be like more advocacy looking forward, or should be they rest on existing uh, legal principle. And I think to me one of the strength of resting on legal principle, you you can say you're, ob you're obliged already in a way. The, the, we are sort of trying to help you in how to interpret obligations that you already have accepted. That to me is a strong message. Okay, um, I would like to open the floor. I have a couple of questions uh, online, uh, but I, I hope that there are some questions in the room. If there are no questions, okay, I can see multiplicity of... of okay, we have... Um, Daniela with the microphone. There is a gentleman with a white shirt and a dark tie. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Tom Buys. I work for Wemos, a Dutch-based global health organization. And tonight you were discussing a lot on the uh, responsibilities that private companies have, have as well, in particular pharmaceutical companies. Um, but in the ongoing international discussions, we talk about the responsibilities of governments towards their citizens. Do you think that pharmaceutical companies or any other private companies 
have a duty of care towards citizens? And if yes, what should governments do to uphold that, um, yeah, that, that duty of care? Thank you. Maybe let's get a couple of questions. There was another question. Yeah. The, 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 the young lady. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> Hi, my name is Valeria Scheiviller, and I'm a fifth year medical student. I'm also the Swiss Youth Delegate to this World Health Assembly. So, my question goes to all of you. Like, you have been, especially <clears throat> Magdalena, you have been. You have been addressing like how COVID has accelerated like the inequalities, especially for girls and young women. So my question is like I'm quite a solution-based person. So and he also addressed private uh, previously what what could how can like also non-state actors and also companies overcome this inequality. So my question would be what are your recommendations for solutions to overcome these inequalities caused by COVID-19 and what can also we as like normal people to do to overcome these inequalities? Thank you. Thank you. The, yeah. Third question be, be just behind you. They not. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Rita. I'm also a medical student, but I'm with the International Federation of Medical Students Association delegation. And I would like to know how is this treaty supporting the post-pandemic recovery, especially when referring to vulnerable groups? And how can we make states accountable for this recovery post-pandemic? Would you like to... Start to respond to these three questions, or you 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 don't all have to respond. But if you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I will respond to the two first question. Um, I'm I'm going to be precise because the as we have been discussing, the principles follow what is uh, existing international human rights law uh, or existing international law. So the principles set that the state must regulate and monitor private actors. So the principles in themselves are not putting obligations directly into the private actors. Um, I think that that is the next evolution of uh, international law in general, but the principles now are starting what exists. So, but there is a lot that can be done if a state uh, strongly regulate and monitor what public actors um, do. So we will be tackling several of those problems. In terms of um, gender inequality, um, I I'm going to give you my, my personal view. I mean, one, uh, for me, one of the structural problems for gender inequality is precisely the um, the unjust distribution of unpaid care and domestic work. Um, and, and this is striking. So it's in every country around the world. So women share the burden of uncare and domestic work and it diminish when women have higher level of education and access to money because they can buy care work or domestic work by other women, normally immigrants, from uh, maybe indigenous peoples to the city or other immigrants from, from the country. So that is the, the, the main obstacles for gender inequality. It set the difference on how girls and women are going to be uh, enjoying their rights in, in a, an absolute discriminatory manner in comparison with men. And the striking part is that for men it's almost flat. So it doesn't matter your um, economic or educational background, you kind of uh, do your care and domestic work more or less equally um, and in women change. So that, that is one issue that can be addressed. How, and I'm going to link it to the other, uh, to the other question, we ha what we are seeing now is that there is a lot of transna transnational corporations that are providing care. So what they do, they take the nurses and the care workers from the public service and they precarize their contract because they contract for hours, they don't longer work for the public sector, et cetera, and they are providing that care. We need to go back. 
we need to provide a system in which care and domestic work is equally distributed within the family, between the state and the private sector, and within society. And in there, there's a lot to contribute for everyone here. Everyone can do it. Thank you. Uh, Viviana, would you like to address the question on private companies? Or the, the first question, the duty of care of... Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I agree, Magdalena has said, there are existing obligations already. So one is that advocacy that should be stronger, I think, on, on this point. Um, I think where we need to be more creative of where um, human rights law will evolve is on the extraterritorial nature um, of that and how that applies, but at least with respect to the country of origin of the enterprise, we have existing obligations that we can see. And, and we should all be, you know, um, Again, on COVID, so many examples that, uh, you know, it's, it's really shameful, the lack of, for example, transparency of basic information that there was, including on the vaccine contracts, and then to say as if governments had their hands tied. Um, these kinds of things really should, should not happen again in a pandemic instrument, so if in, in, in the future pandemic. Um, right now, a big worry for us is those those norm setting exercises we're seeing are not addressing those issues. There is a complete reluctance of many countries to add any of these actions, anything that has to do with vaccine hoarding, regulations on you know, the business actors. And, and this is a big problem because if we don't include those issues, then you know, we're getting nowhere. So, yeah. Yeah, good point. I remember when the European Union was more or less forced to disclose the contract with AstraZeneca, half of it was redacted. They were more black than, than things you could read. That was uh, really embarrassing. Uh, I have two questions online, and they're both on economic and social rights. Uh, one is for Professor Benjamin Mesomayer, that we mentioned already, uh, the, the, the current chair of the Global Health Law Consortium, and the other from uh, Bill Jeffrey from the Center of Health Science. And so I, I will read them, I don't, don't want to paraphrase, but basically one of the limits of Syracuse is that it was focused, as you said, Sam, on civil and political rights. Uh, so as we seek to implement this principle, how can economic and social rights, particularly the right to health, provide the basis for framing pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response? And Bill Jeffrey, um, he says, so, so much attention has been focused on unequal access to testing, vaccination, healthcare, but the lion's share of expenditure in high-income countries wa was on um, basically on protecting their own population on uh, more than a thousand-fold more times than supplementing official development assistance. So try to uh, help developing countries ensure also the, the, the economic and social rights. So it opens the, in a way, how to be more holistic in terms of human rights and how can the principles help. Would you like to, to start on this? Sure. Um, it's true that the Syracuse principles uh, were really focused on the limited issue of derogations from the covenant on civil and political rights. But as we've discussed, the process of the development of international law uh, means that the, the core part of the Syracuse principles, namely that restrictions on human rights by states must be legitimate, necessary, proportional, legal, and limited in, in time and scope, and non-discriminatory. That, that kind of a basic, almost constitutional analysis of, of the legality of, of uh, certain behaviors has really been taken on board I think as part of customary international law. And we start seeing that, uh, that notion repeated in multiple different arenas, including economic, social, and cultural rights. But that's about, the, uh, that's about restrictions on rights. Um, the other part of the, of the principles that I really encourage everyone to look at is coming out of the world of economic, social, and cultural rights and ensuring that states use the resources that they have to the extent that they can to progressively implement rights. And that's a, that's a, very, important, that's a very important notion. Uh, and we have seen advances, well, I was going to say, we've seen advances in the assessment and analysis of those rights, though probably not as much in terms of the implementation. 
But for instance, looking at the area of the responsibility of non-state actors, and particularly um, uh, for profit entities, for businesses, um, 30 years ago when I was working on this topic uh, at, uh, at Erasmus University, there was, there was zero possibility. I mean, there was just a blanket statement that international law does not apply to non-state actors. The states were absolutely clear about that, and the companies were absolutely clear about that. And we've moved quite, quite a bit from there. At, at this point, the notion that companies have some obligations under international law is, I would argue, pretty much accepted. We, it's being pushed in terms of around the context of a treaty on business and human rights itself, but we've seen it re uh, repeatedly uh, and explicitly confirmed through various statements, both at the international level, the human rights, various human rights bodies, uh, but also importantly at the regional and, and national levels. In the context of, of COVID, I think I, I was surprised that we didn't see more litigation against uh, 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 against companies, especially the ones involving uh, uh, the, the development and, and sale of vaccines. I still don't think that that's over. I think we will come to see more about what really happened in this process, and I think it and there is room for national um, litigation, uh, particularly in the seats of most of these companies, which tend to be in. Um, in the North Atlantic region. So there, there really is room. There is a clear uh, acknowledgement in the principles that these are not just about the restricting the restrictions on rights, but also about ensuring that states uh, perform their, their responsibility to make sure that the right to health is, is properly um, uh, and, and other economic social rights are properly manifested. And, I, and just to, to um, you know, as Magdalena pointed out, the, we now have clearly seen in, in the worst kind of uh, way possible the impact, the disproportionate impact that an event like a pandemic has on, on women and on girls and generally on marginalized people. And so, the principles suggest a way for states to start preparing for that, to think about it, so that you can prepare. The next time where you say nobody can go into the streets to work, think about what that means. For, for you and I, we will say, oh, I'll just work virtually. It's nice. But for, for people who are mostly living their work in the informal sector, who have to go out for, for, for many women who are selling things on the street, not in a shop necessarily, or who are even working as laborers, that is a death sentence. They don't have resources to pull from. Uh, and what was astonishing and heartbreaking is to see government and governments across the world completely ignore that. There were absolute bans on people coming into the street as a result of COVID, which meant that millions, hundreds of millions of people who were not working in offices were unable to work, were unable to earn a living, and this disproportionately affected women most, most clearly. So we have to learn that lesson, and we have to use these principles to put in place legislation, to put in place rules and regulations, to say the next time this happens, we have to think about how we're going to address, to address this problem. And it can't just be that we will give uh, money to companies to to support their uh, workers who can't come to the office, but we will support the informal sector where, in fact, the majority of p people of most countries live and work. Thank you. So you, uh, both of you mentioned litigation. And um, just for the people in the audience, if you're interested, there is a database called COVID litigation, COVID-19 litigation.org, I believe. And it's uh, sort of run by an Italian university. Uh, it's a project financed by WHO. Uh, and they, I think, have a database at this point of something like more than 2,000 judgments. And as far as I know, most of the judgments are 
uh, not against companies, but against government. For vaccine mandates, you start seeing uh, on, on lockdowns, but in particular on vaccine, of people that didn't want to have to be compulsory vaccinated and so on. And in the European context, I think it will soon trickle up to the European Court of Human Rights. So that's definitely a space to continue, to continue looking at. Okay, uh, yeah, there are more questions. Uh, just to invite you to stay until the end, there is a reception, so that's normally an incentive not to leave before the end. Um, I, uh, yes, uh, so uh, the gentleman here and in front, yes. And still inviting people online to, uh, to ask questions to the Q&A, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm interested on if you could give us some examples of a behavior of a, a uh, drug companies uh, that will be, you know, consider human rights violations. You know, uh, would you think that the deny of transfer of uh, technology to allow, you know, wider production could, could and that end, end up, you know, like with, with the lack of uh, drugs for people who need it, would that could be considered a human rights violation? Or if that's not the case, which, uh, behavior you would think that will meet the standards for a human right violation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Sandra and I'm with the ICJ. Um, I, I have a quick comment with, on which I, I would really welcome um, reactions, especially from, from you, Viviana, if you, if you wish to. Um, and it is related to what we have been discussing on, at the international level with the, uh, the pandemic treaty. Um, I, I think uh, Rogine started her um, state or her uh, speech with uh, the first pillar on coherence. Uh, and I think one thing that is very practical is the lack of coherence in, in government or state policies and state positions. Uh, so we are seeing uh, that um, diplomats who are negotiating at the WHO have very different positions from their colleagues some meters away at the Palais des Nations or, <laughs> uh, sorry, during the Human Rights Council, for instance. And this is something we we experience all the time. And that's a very concrete point, is how do we ensure more coherence uh, and less schizophrenia of states when they negotiate things. So it's not only that uh, constituencies don't work so much with each other and know each other, but it's also really within uh, the state apparatus uh, when it comes to international negotiations. So I would really welcome any comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, so lack of coherence starts at home in a way. Yeah, the, the lady there, yeah, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sarah Collinson. I'm from an organization called Sight Savers that works on disability issues in the International Disability and Development Consortium. And we also participate in the Civil Society Alliance for Human Rights in the Pandemic Treaty. Um, one of the things that we've seen happen in the IMB negotiations recently is a loss of access for civil society organizations. And I suppose one of the key human rights that we should be concerned about is the right to participate. And um, perhaps um, as civil society organizations are squeezed out of those forums, then one of the first casualties of that that we might see is a, is a loss of focus on, on human rights priorities, particularly taking into account what uh, the, the observation about um, the lack of contact between the human rights experts and public health experts in some of the missions and delegations that are involved in negotiating the pandemic treaty. Um, so my question is, what advice does the panel have for a civil society organizations like ours to to maintain that um, sort of pressure around the right to participate as well as other human rights? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, I had a question online from Maria Chiara Campisi from the International Development Law Organization, which again talks about the, the future uh, of the principle, how they can get traction. And she's asking, can we envisage some level of endorsement of the principle by, by, through UN decision bodies, as done for other set of principles, whether it's a General Assembly, a Human Rights Council, and so on. I guess it's a bit of a crystal ball, but uh, we, we have our own, uh, our own views on this. Um, who would like to start? Viviana? Sure. I'll start addressing, uh, I think, two questions. One was previously asked um, just about um, the use of overseas development assistance. So just to note on that, I think 
I mean, we have seen a progressive decrease on overseas development assistance in the area of health, um, and this because it's also going to separate areas. So we've seen that the same pot of overseas development assistance has now been distributed to many different areas. Um, so I think it's a good point to recall that this is important. At the same time, also to note that what is also being asked for is, you know, some uh, addressing structural elements of why we have the inequalities we have in the economics system and as well in the current governance structures. And this goes from the financial architecture to also our global health governance architecture. So for example, one of the asks of many developing countries and least developed countries with respect to the future um, capacity to, to um, address the lack of access issues in pandemics is to strengthen regional manufacturing capacity and local capacity, which you know, it's progressive steps to get there, but we need to build that starting now. And so that is concretely different from what I was saying, you know, when we want to see real solidarity versus, you know, we, we want to be partners, um, this is important, it's, it's health for all, um, versus when that is just, um, you know, what we say, but then the actions are not proving, and, and what we're left of is basic charity, and with that same let's say, um, colonialist mindset, wh whether it might not be necessarily meant to be that way, but it leads to that same structural inequalities. So rather than focusing necessarily on that, we're saying, for example, we need sources of funding to really help um, from what countries need to do those transformations, which include you know, some issues that are restrictions of the international systems that we have. So that's why that's really important that we address that because or else you know, we're always with that charity model or over-reliance and overseas development assistance and we need countries and that's what they're also asking is for self-reliance. And secondly, on the policy coherence issue, um, of course, it's, it's, it's part of that interplay between interests and different stakeholders. And domestically, the fact that we have growing in all countries, and Magdalena said, huge inequality. That means that you know, we don't have a state that's responsive in the same way to all citizens. And that is one of the big problems. We need uh, to have accountability so that every life, no matter um, who it is, um, has that same value as a citizen. And so the states, what we see when we have an international representation is a mixture of, first of all, who is playing in that soup of stakeholder interest and who's getting um, a stronghold. And definitely on many areas, we're seeing that the more powerful economic actors have a greater voice. Um, so that state regulating role needs to be put back in the picture as we saw in COVID. Um, it was overstepped on many areas, for example, in, in the management of non-pharmaceutical um, actions that were taken. But in others, um, such as in, in, in vaccine, diagnostic and treatment actions, we've seen simply that we've said, we'll let the market take care of it, we'll pay as much as you know is needed, and that's it, that will make our citizens happy. So um, I think that that's where I think policy coherence also means that um, as we, we deal with uh, in the Geneva context, um, these interlinkages between you know, the trade forums, the human rights forums, the public health uh, forums is um, having, having you know, and that's why I think again, the, the, these uh, human rights is really a good way again to bring these together um, and to try to call for that more correcting of that imbalance interest between stakeholders. Views from Magdalena or Sam? For example, on, uh, on, on civil society participation, the question on, on that. It, it's interesting because WHO says this is the, the negotiating process with the highest level of civil society participation. But civil society has totally different views. So there's a bit really disconnect there. So. Abuses, I should say, technically by by uh, non-state actors. I, I, do, I, I do think it's fair to say that the assertion of patents by the vaccine makers uh, really at a global level was, it was an abusive practice. And the fact that states stepped in and actually used the existing trade treaties to, to try to protect that, uh, that patent from the possibility of having uh, cheaper manufacturing around the world was at a global level a uh, uh, violation of uh, 
of human rights and, and the principle of solidarity by, by states and by the companies. At the national level, what we saw very increasingly, and something that the principals do a very good job of addressing, is that we've seen many um, health functions have been privatized recently. And what we saw in that context is hospitals or insurance companies who refuse to help people, who refuse to provide uh, assistance to people. And, and that is something where especially where a non-state entity steps into an area that is normally the purview of the state, they assume some of the obligations of the state. And I think those are violations and abusive practices. And we have seen some challenges to those. So I think that's part of it. Um, in terms of um, civil society, it's a shame that Steve uh, isn't here. Uh, this has really been um, a heartbreaking moment. I think the IHR and pandemic treaty processes have been unusually opaque, actually, and, and this is just silly. We, we had seen perhaps some advances in the context of climate change. I think there was some greater engagement with, with civil society. and. It's absolutely clear, looking at the work that's being done around um, these two health-related treaties, that the ministries of health, with all due respect to all the public health uh, lawyers out there, are, are, are out of their depth. They're, they're just unaware. I think, John Luca, as you put it, they just don't have human rights literacy. And so they are responding to issues as if they are the first time that anybody has seen these. And yet there is an entire body of, of law uh, going back decades for, for this response and blocking civil society from that um, involvement, I think is a huge mistake. What can we really do about it? Again, uh, in the context of these principles, and they're explicit about this, these are not going to the root causes. Uh, I think, Magdalena, if I may steal your phrase, this is not a perfect storm. This is not a natural phenomenon that we are all just looking there. This is not a solar flare that we are thinking, oh, wow, what, what has happened? We are like drunk people running around a room that full of glass that we broke. And then we're saying, why is it that we're bleeding all over the place? And it's the shoemakers that are making all the money. And, and we don't understand what's, what's happened here. And, and I do hope that uh, the, the notion of decolonizing this, this structure, of challenging this structure, this structure of, of, of really questioning the basics of the system that we have now, the finance system, the WTO, the, inter the intellectual property regime around the world, uh, gains currency because it is clear that the threats uh, related to climate change and everything that's ensuing from it, and in part I think pandemics are, are, are part of that, demand that we do something more structural. For now, these principles at least help move us in the right direction. They're not, this is not a statement of revolution. Uh, this is just a, a reform process, but, but it's the, the energy for change comes from uh, calls for revolution that, that may then result in reforms, I hope, before, well, now I'm, now I'm gonna end on a bad note, before the end of humanity, so yeah. <laughs> So we have some metaphors that we say we are end of humanity is one and is wonderful. So drunk people breaking glasses and the shoemaker making money. We have to remember that one. Magdalena, want to supplement? Okay. Uh, so maybe uh, we are coming close to to the end. Maybe a last round of of questions. Uh, so we are quite on this side. At least seventeen questions on this side. Let's say. Yes. Um. Hi. Yeah, it works. I'm Yuya Huang. I'm representing International Pharmaceutical Federation and IPSF, International Student for, uh, Pharmaceutical uh, IPSF, the studentship. <laughs> um, as the saying goes, uh, crisis reveals and builds character. Um, I would like to ask all of you, uh, in your opinion, had the pandemic treaty really demonstrated the character of the collectiveness of the global society? Like it demonstrated who we are in emergencies or did it demonstrate who we are um, in crisis or it, does it really demonstrate who we are or does it demonstrate like 
we were in a fright, we were, uh, we were frightened, or does it really reflect who we are? Okay, existential question. Yeah. Okay. There's a lady with a red shirt right there. Yeah. As we digitalize, we transfer the control of infrastructure and the decision making, the, the governance from the public sector to private actors who are financed by targeted advertising. How do you imagine this framework being picked up by these very handful of actors and um, how do you imagine them integrating this into these automated systems that are essentially taking control of our, our public infrastructure? On basically a corporate takeover in a way. Uh, final question. Um, Moin, you choose a lady, you want to give it. It's got to be good now. Um, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Christie from UNAIDS. Um, it's a two-parter, actually. First, as a practitioner who definitely wants to be able to use these principles, will there be an annotated version or a commentary with the sources? And second, um, I completely agree, it would be fantastic to have a line in the accord that says something like, you know, this does not affect existing human rights obligations. However, in the principles that you have, there are some really fantastic positive obligations in relation to consulting with civil society and community-led organisations and around extraterritorial obligations. And from my perspective, if this um, accord is to protect human rights or at least be human rights compliant, isn't there a requirement to ensure that within that those positive obligations exist and things are given form? So, for example, with uh, civil society consultation, the accord actually has something within it that spells out how that will happen at an international level. Um, and if we don't have that, you know, are we really going to see um, proper consultation with civil society happening in a way that is uh, compliant with human rights? With apology, I know there are many more questions, but uh, ju just a final one online to give equal opportunities from Alessia Nicastro from the Global Health Center uh, about implementation. So what lessons can global health uh, learn from the human rights field in terms of implementation mechanism, compliance mechanism, implementation mechanism, how to ensure the human rights related provisions are not only included in the pandemic instruments, if they are, but then also implemented at both the national and international level. So that they don't remain a bargaining chip in international negotiations, but they really have substance attraction at the, at the national level. So I think with this round of questions, uh, we can come close to the end. Who wants to start? Sam? Yeah. Um, the, uh, on the existential question, I think, uh, uh, let me be careful. Uh, this, this pandemic had devastating results on the lives of millions, really billions of people around the world. This was one of the first times in recent memory, certainly in our lifetime, where everybody in the world faced the same problem. And it could have been a moment where humanity could have all come together and said, if we can work together and we have the means and the resources to beat this global problem. That's not really what happened. And so I, I can't say that we're lucky, but we managed to face this crisis fairly quickly. It's not at all necessary that the next pandemic will be like this. It could be, it could be far worse. It could be far worse. Um, and so I think this was a wake-up call for humanity. I think for me, it was a very worrying call. And, and so part of the urgency, uh, I mean, as a lawyer uh, in a suit and tie who's dedicated to a reformist process, uh, I, I, I've said it, I think that we need that revolutionary pressure to make my job possible, to make that reform possible, because I think we really failed as a, as a, as a, as a society organized the way that, that it is. Um, 
what can what can we really do? What is the response then to uh, to this? For me, the uh, these principles are very useful, especially because they they set out a way for states and non-state actors to organize themselves and to respond to it. Again, the fact that we are now talking about non-state actors in a way and we're, we're envisioning their accountability to me is a huge step forward that has happened. I'm a former corporate lawyer. And, and the important thing about corporations is that they are actually, notwithstanding what the US Supreme Court says, they are not people. They are entirely creatures of the law. They're exactly what a state says they are. The state can say tomorrow, you will pay these taxes, you will organize yourself this way, and the corporations will have to do it. There's no question about that. We've seen this once before about 110 years ago when countries around the world did respond to monopolies by, by breaking them up and by responding to them. And I, and I do get a sense that, that states and people around the world are now quite concerned about where uh, how much control non-state actors have. And they should be, because we've seen them operate in the worst way during this pandemic. These principles at least provide some way forward, I think, for states and for societies to try to reform, uh, to reform themselves. And part of that reform is to give greater room for civil society to, to work through the lens of human rights, this, this notion that at the end of the day, everything we do has to do with the welfare of humans around the world. And, and we have to either accept that or, or fail as, and come to the end of humanity. <laughs> I would have never said you used to be a corporate lawyer. This is a, it, it's an evening or a revelation. So. <laughs> I, I would like to compliment by saying that one of the key features of the principle, and um, it's kind of built on the basis of that, it's not very explicit, is the principle of solidarity. And that is at the core of human rights. I mean, the human rights values from the Enlightenment start, started with the issue of solidarity. And we got lost. I mean, the, the principle of international assistance and cooperation, it's already in the chart of United Nations. So it is there from the very beginning. And we need to uh, really work on that. The only way in which we can address uh, public health pandemic is with solidarity. And I think that it was clearly described on the issue of vac the vaccine inequity. Without solidarity, we, we can do that. But also solidarity in the way we uh, reacted in our own countries. We saw how the elites in many countries, like in the UK, were above any restriction on, on COVID because there was a lack of solidarity. Public health, the only way to treat it is if we, we are, we're all going to be well if we take care of our neighbor. And the same happened with climate change and the same happened not only in regarding solidarity within countries, but also solidarity between countries. And I think that those clauses in the principles that go back to issues of international assistance and cooperation, extraterritorial obligation, speak precisely on solidarity. And I think that this, by the way, that this is one of the great challenge of the human rights movement today, how we go back to the core of the principle of solidarity as we move forward to address the, um, the crisis in which we're living in. Thank you, Viviana, any last uh, thought? Yes, very shortly. I think on the first question, I would just comment, I think that we've ingrained very much this individual rights approach. It's also important to think, you know, that we have to strengthen that, that collective sense. And I think the pandemics is really a moment that shows um, why that is needed. And that takes different aspects. I mean, at community level, we saw that a lot of the responses that worked were really when we saw that collective sense or, or solidarity as well. Um, so uh, just, just, important to highlight that because a lot of the safety nets in developing countries or in poor uh, contexts are really on the ground between communities, people, you know, looking out for each other and not really necessarily what the state is providing. Um, so those uh, society structures, if we can also highlight that mutual collective uh, right approach, it's really um, important because there's, I think, that 
over reliance on on that individual approach. You know, in the case of vaccines, again, I need it, my family needs it, but everyone else, you know, it doesn't really matter. And you might have heard that talking with your family members, your friends, and so forth. Um, so, so back to that collectivity, as, also as as a as a personal value, society value, I think would help us forward. As just a comment to that first question. Um, second, the idea of global, building global common goods or global public goods, it's it's an important um, idea. I think that that needs to be built, of course, from you know from the economic theory, moving from that to really understand what's the basis of this is saying we can build things that we all need in a different way. We don't have to rely on existing structures, um, and that should be pathways, I think, for the researchers between you. That's a that's just a, a good way forward to think, you know, creatively of how, how this can be done. On the issue of digitalization, I think that's a huge question. I think even you know at the UNGA level, being grappled with, um, you know, where are we going to look for um, uh, from moving from the global digital compact to the future we want and so forth. This is a key element there. It's basically you know we're we're letting private um, non-state for-profit actors um, set the baseline of platforms that we all need, um, and and so how will we ensure that you know we have adequate state regulation that do, does not also impede um, what what might we do in the digital world? Um, um, so again, a digital, uh, a rights-based approach for that digital world that we're creating is, is really essential as well. And on implementation of principles, I think it's already been, been very well said, just to mention again, advocacy. Um, is one way forward for implementation, um, particularly national level. I think that's where we can see things happening. First, very context specific. Um, in the case of climate change, um, and addressing you know um, uh, uh, non-state actor actions, this is what's really been been uh, significant. We've seen in the Netherlands. We've seen other cases where this has really um, worked. So uh, litigation, national level with advocacy, um, should be you know key venues as well for implementation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I won't even try to summarize what uh, came out of the panel, also because Rogine is sort of staring daggers at me, and she's going to give uh, some c closing remarks, but may I uh, ask you to join me in thanking the panelists. We grilled quite royally, and they've been very good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, John Luca. Thank you to our panelists uh, for this and, and the audience for the incredibly rich discussion. Um, I'm going to be very brief, and I also won't try to summarize things. Uh, I guess I, I want to leave us with one scenario to think about uh, that I heard at the UNAID side event earlier today, and that is that if there was a, a subvariant of COVID-19 that emerged today that was more dangerous, do we feel that we would be prepared? Do we feel that the lessons of that of the past three years would have resonated in any shape or form uh, to, to help us do things differently? And the answer, I think we would all agree, given the, the track of pandemic accord uh, and IHR negotiations, is of course no. Um, and so that's why these, the, the dissemination process of these principles is incredibly important. So I invite you all to really engage with us in discussions on this, to really appropriate it for yourselves and for your own uses and purposes. Um, and and uh, thank you so much again for being here and for, for, for help for thinking through this with us. Just to quickly address uh, one part of uh, Emily's really great comment, there will absolutely be legal commentaries, many of them, to the principles. Um, and and sir, for the furthermore dissemination work, including a live website. So stay tuned. Follow at GS, GHL Consortium on Twitter. Uh, we will we will be posting all those updates there. Um, the recordings of this will be available as well. Thank you, John Luca. And in closing, um, uh, before we end, please also. Um, uh, note that we will have, courtesy of Physicians for Human Rights and the Global Health Law Consortium, some uh, drinks upstairs and, and some light aperitifs. But also thank me in, in, in uh, a round of applause for the Global Health Center staff, uh, Ellen, Alessia, and uh, Moin, who were truly heroic, and Bettina, who couldn't be here today. So, yeah, thank you.